All right, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for showing up after break. Um, my name's Lewis Kieser. I'm with Comcast Cable, um, and I'm here to show you how we develop something that we call service agility, utilizing Nginx, um, and kind of some of the benefits it gave us. So I am kind of broke this into three pieces, basically kind of, first part's gonna be talking about what our initial problem case was, like who our users are, what we're trying to do, then break down actually how we did it, and then I'm gonna end with some config examples because if you can't show a config, it never really happened. So where we are in Comcast is specifically developing the applications used by those employees and partners who are directly assisting subscribers. So that's both people talking to you on the phone, email, text message, social media, but also agents in retail stores, and also technicians that come in to actually do field installs. Uh, primarily on just the, the residential side, um, some small business, but business is a separate unit. Uh, one of the big things we try and do is Comcast has a lot of different systems within it because it's got a lot of different products. Uh, one of the problems it was had for many, many years was you're asking an agent to have to swivel seat among a whole bunch of different screens. That does nothing but just drive aggravation for the subscriber because how many people have been on a support call and had to wait while the, the support agent on the other end of the phone waited for a system respond or they had to pull up another system or they had to switch to another screen. So our idea was just completely change that, make a common pane of glass. So we, we had a couple different versions of it. Everything previously was semi-monolithic. By that I mean we didn't have a true monolithic web app. We actually had a UI component and then we had various reusable modules that it would then load in process. So we decided we had to rebuild it. So we had three major issues we had to deal with. First of them was just the amount of dependencies we have. As I said, we have a ton of different systems. Each one of those systems is differently deployed. Each one of those systems is differently run, different technology, different stack, whole nine yards. We had to deal with the fact that our users are everywhere. So the people who are assisting customers are not only in one central location, they're scattered all throughout the world. So not just in CONUS, but you've also got Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia, you've got India, you've got uh, some in Eastern Europe, all over the place. And the last big issue was we're in the middle of trying to migrate. So previously we were built on .NET and IIS. We want to move to a more modern platform, a platform that gave us even more interchangeability. For that we chose to use Angular and back it up with, with microservices. So kind of converting our old monolithic com components into smaller, lighter microservices. So we decided to use Nginx Plus for that. So a couple of reasons. One, we already had a history with them. We were using them as an API gateway tier. Uh, we had a lot of success with that. It allowed us to independently scale resources. We didn't have to put everything in the same box. It also gave us a lot of flexibility in being able to make very fast changes. So if we had to provision a new component, we had to remove a component, we had to change a, uh, an amount or a capacity, we could do it almost immediately. As fast as we could push a configuration, the changes were live. Um, so we had a lot of experience. The engineers were working with it day in, day out. The actual DevOps engineers had a lot of experience with it as that kind of API gateway model. So we didn't have to do a whole lot of retraining. So how did we actually build a great new resilient model? So we did, again, three core technologies, noticing a theme. Um, first, we came up with this concept of service agility where I want to be able to dynamically send traffic to the most performant microservice location. So if I have two data centers, I want to send as much traffic as I can to the data center that's going to perform fastest to give me the best result, independent of where that may be. So I'm only concerned about speed. 
I want to build the concept of being able to automatically retry if I get a failure. So if I'm talking to a data center and it times out, instead of just returning to a user an error, which is just gonna destroy that user experience, I wanna retry that behind the scenes so they never actually see it. Because a user's gonna take slight latency a lot better than they're gonna take a flat out error. And the last part of it was content caching. As I said, we've got, people, we've got call centers all over the place. A lot of the applications we're dealing with, their content is only located in one, maybe two data centers. And that data center cannot even be anywhere close. For example, you could have a call center up here trying to read data from on the East Coast. So even if you have the fastest network in the world, which I feel like I should be obliged to say Comcast has, but I can't prove it. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. Even if the fast network in the world, if you're transferring very large images constantly, you're gonna saturate that network. You're gonna start seeing latency on the end user. And even if it only takes a couple seconds to load, that's still a couple seconds where that user is sitting at a hole in their screen. It's also gonna back up every other call that you're trying to send down the wire for that session. As we get into more of that very small, very small microservice world, you're sending a lot more, lot more requests downstream than you used to. Previously, I just built all that in the back end, who cared? I just sent you a data dump. Now I'm sending you data constantly. So if I start backing up that stream, a lot more impactful. So if I can start caching that content close to the user, everything looks better. Plus, users are willing to wait a second. If I'm showing you a knowledge base article and that picture of that modem pops up, if it takes another two seconds for that text to pop up below it, most people don't notice because they see that first visual representation, like everything's good, no latency, we're good. So for service agility, we got it by doing a couple different things. And we're triggering on a couple different things. So first, obvious, HP error rate. We're not just setting it for a, a static amount. We actually, through a lot of performance testing, are adjusting this. It is specific, and I guess I don't really get into it in here, but um, it's also specific. So when we build our upstreams, every microservice endpoint is an upstream. So when we're tuning our HTTP errors, we're tuning it based on those upstreams. Some upstreams may throw up more errors than other upstreams, just the nature of it. Um, that's also, we'll lead into later when I start talking about the retries. So just put a pin on that for now. The other is we built an entire, H, an entire health check API into every one of our microservices. That's not just a simple, hey, I'm a live page. Developers actually went in and started adding content to this that we, as a DevOps team, Whoever that engineer is setting up that environment can pick and choose what health components they want responding. So it can be as simple as, do you have an active process? You do, you pass. It can be as complex as, well, do you have an active process? Are all your Hystrix threads working properly? Are you exceeding the amount of RAM, do you have, RAM you have? Is your time synced with the time server properly? Um, do you have the required number of instances and is this d dependency for your data in good shape? So we can scale that in. That's important because that's also a big thing I'm using to drive whether or not I'm talking to a healthy microservice tier. If I'm not talking to a healthy group of microservices, even though I'm responding in like sub 50 milliseconds, if I'm getting garbage, doesn't matter how fast it is, it's still garbage and average response time. So as I said, how fast is it responding? I want to go to the most performant if I can. If I pass all the other criteria, I'm not exceeding my upstream health failure rate, my health checks are patch passing all my match rules, I want to go to the fastest available from the point of view of the, mic from the, point of view of the UI you're talking to. Automatic retries. So, we really jumped into this, because this, this was one of the big things we uh, got a lot of benefit out of. So we have some backends that 
believe it or not, they use a 500 error code as a, nope, can't find it. So it should be a 200, but they pass it as a 500 instead. This lets us go and retry. It also covers those situations where I have a downstream that fails in one data center. So in my UI tier, if I'm setting up different, micro, different microservice data centers, I can say, well, that data center didn't work. Let me try this one over here. So if microservice data center A and microservice data center B are talking to two different dependencies, A's dependency might be down, B's might work. Or maybe I talked to A and actually got an error before I hit enough errors to trigger that upstream name out. So I can keep going and keep retrying. I can retry as many times as I want within the timeouts I set. And again, this is something that we go through and we're setting based upon the individual microservice responses. So there is no hard and fast rule on this. This really is a keep twisting the knob until it makes sense for you. Um, it's the big thing I cannot repeat enough for this is you need to test this and you need to continually check it, especially if you're in a case where you have a diverse number of backends because they're doing code deploys too. So they're making performance changes. So whereas giving a backend or giving one of our microservices a 45 second window to respond may have been perfectly fine today someone may have added additional code two, two steps downstream from you, and your average response time may have changed from an average of 20 seconds with a spike of 40 to an average of 35 seconds with a spike of a minute and a half. It's happened to us a couple times. That's why I'm hammering that a little bit. All right, and the last thing, content caching. Nginx makes this really easy uh, with the read-through caching. Uh, we've started using it specifically in caching not only just straight up backend data, but we're also going in and using, location, using the locations and the pattern matching, we're actually taking some microservices that are gateways to other services and some of that content is image. So if I'm calling for information about a specific device and that call returns that specific image, that specific call in that microservice, instead of running it directly from the UI to the microservice or to that microservice gateway, I'm running it through a proxy cache and then out. So that way, if I'm calling that, calling that microservice and I know when I call it for that specific model of um, modem, it's gonna return this image, I don't make that call every time. I'm automatically caching on the fly that backend system doesn't have to do anything different. So from their point of view, nothing's changed. But I'm still capturing every one of those images coming back. We found this works a little better than just flat out running everything through the proxy and then trying to put like a, a JPEG filter on, on it or anything like that. Um, we had a little more success with actually building the secondary location and then having like the root default to the microservice and then that specific named path, that specific function call going through the proxy. Um, we found that if you just called everything through the proxy, it just added too much overhead because it was evaluating every call. By splitting off some of those, we didn't lose the benefit of the caching close. All right, so some of the examples, and I realize I'm kind of blowing through this because I want to be able to answer questions. So, so this is an example of one of the retries we have set up. So in my actual location, I'm specifying all the things that I wanna retry based upon. Um, so I can tailor them for actual things I care about. So in this case, I, I wanna retry if I get an error, if I time out, if I get a bad header back, um, if I get an HTTP, or I get a 500. So, if I'm getting like a, is it 403 is unauthorized? I don't, I don't care. I'm just gonna return that back. I'm not gonna bother retrying because if you're not authorized, you're just not gonna be authorized. Um, also sending it for non, 
adepident, and yes, I know I butchered that. Um, that means it's just going to send the exact same request again. So it's just going to re—it's just going to retry it. I'm um, setting the number of times to bother to try. Um, so I'm going to have it retry once. Uh, I'm setting the timeout, so how long I'm going to wait for the upstream to bother to respond. I'm going to set the max duration that I'm actually going to. I'm going to wait before I just give up. Um, I've noticed a lot of stuff online where they get proxy read and upstream timeout confused. So um, I also fell victim to that when we first launched this. Uh, they actually are very important. Um, if you get them backwards, it will not work properly, and you will be awake at 3 o'clock in the morning and wondering why you're not actually jumping on latent calls. Next is kind of, uh, of our service agility and kind of how we're currently using it. So in this, um, kind of also showing, so we've got the time-based routing, which is at least time last byte. That's a plus feature. Um, so that's basically saying that my, I want to route on whichever is responding, whichever upstream is responding the fastest for the full response. There's also first byte, which is whichever one answers first but I'm concerned about the full response. We have uh, our active health check. I have a pattern match. Uh, I actually have two different, or do I have two on this? No, I've got one, so all right. So I've got my health check, I've got my match rule, and then I've got some of my responses. So in this case, I'm passing back a whole string of JSON datas, uh, JSON responses. As you can see, I've got multiple, multiple pieces of data in here, just not a simple yes, no. And then I've got, for example, failed responses. So as you can see, I'm looking specifically for that cast list value. In this case, they're all set to no, so I'm gonna fail out. And they're set to no for different reasons. So this is just, it failed for an unspecified reason. This case, it failed because its role value is set to zero. Um, in this case, it failed because I, hadn't, I didn't have a proper number of monsters. So this, if you're just doing it basically, probably doesn't help you much, or it doesn't look like it would help you much. But it actually does when you start looking at it from DevOps point of view because now, not only can I be monitoring it in here, but I can also know why my microservice is failing very quickly. So it gives you a shortcut to figure out why is this microservice having a problem. So here's an example of using two different match rules on the same group of upstreams for the same microservice but by using two different match checks, you are able to take it out for some features but not others. So because I'm having that full response in my health API, I can have a microservice that, let's say it does two different functions. One of them requires uh, my device dependency, one of them doesn't. My device dependency goes offline, it's crashed that data center now can no longer process those requests. Rather than completely stop all traffic to that data center because for that microservice, because other, other things running that microservice are still functioning without a problem, I have a second match. That match is only concerned with that call that's failing. So when I'm trying to make that specific call, in this case, named Frankenstein Wolfman, when I'm making that specific call, that's being picked up by the other location because it's closest pattern match, but I'm gonna be able to kick, it, kick out that upstream because I know that service that supports that specific call is unavailable in that data center. That also prevents me from overloading. So as I start shifting traffic away from this data center because it's no longer good for that call, I don't overload every other data center that's running this microservice with traffic that could just as easily be solved here. And what we have seen sometimes is 
by doing this, by splitting some of these up in some of these use cases, you'll actually see your traffic rebalance itself because now that you're no longer taking this other call, which might be a more costly call, which might be affecting your, your response metrics, because you're no longer doing this call in the microservice, that microservice is going to get faster. So it's now going to take more of that traffic, which will kind of displace the load that you're putting on it for the impacted call in the first micro center, microservice. So how we kind of use this in prod is we created a whole series of microservice tiers. Um, they're not all equal. They're all differently sized. They run different microservices. It's not the same cookie cutter. Um, we're running microservices in .NET Core. We're writing them in WebLogic. We're running them in Tomcat, a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to be running them in Unit eventually. We just haven't gotten there yet. Every one of my UI tier, which are serving, their, serving all the user base, is all evaluating for themselves the health of every one of those microservices running in every one of these tiers. It's not the individual instance level, but it knows that device service in DC4 is working just fine, but DC3.2 has latency. So I probably don't want to talk to it. And DC2 is offline. So definitely don't want to send traffic there. Whereas for my UI in DC2, DC1 might be the fastest responder it has. So it's going to send traffic there. And because I'm looking at it at the microservice level, I'm not just saying send everything to one spot. I'm making that evaluation for every microservice. So one interesting side effect that we have seen as we have dependencies underneath, we can actually track when those dependencies move themselves in data centers because we'll watch our data readjust on the fly and I'll watch, looking at one of these UIs, I'll watch all the data start moving to a different data center. So we've actually been on calls where we've watched downstream dependencies do a failover and we've been able to been able to tell before they even call it out. The other fun part is previously, because we had so many dependencies, um, anytime anybody failed, we had an impact. So anytime there was any outage, we got hit. Um, we have now transferred that. Uh, we are now looking at we do not have the same number, number of impacts. In fact, in some cases, we have had serious downstream failures where our dependencies have just gone hard offline in a data center. Or one of our data centers has gone hard offline itself. Our users haven't known. They've seen a blip in latency, and that's it. So it's dramatically dropped our outage minutes. It's changed kind of how we're dealing with the application. So we kind of broke that cycle of constantly being on outage bridges, not being able to get ahead, constantly dealing with, well, yeah, I, I, know, it's my, I, know, I know I'm impacted, but I can't do anything about it. To now, we don't even have to get on bridges sometimes. We, just, we can just sit there and say, nope, look, application's fine. Here's my external metrics. Here's my synthetics. I don't see an error to you. Nope, not joining the bridge. And it's completely transparent, no, no human interaction. We don't have to fail anything over. I don't have to trigger, trigger anything. All automatic, all in the background. All right, so I got about 10 minutes left. Uh, questions? Yeah, just curious how you're uh, driving traffic between the D, the different uh, data centers here. Is it all at the, like a GSLB layer? Is it all DNS no, based? No, so um, you mean entry into the Nginx clusters? Yeah. Yeah, yeah GSLB. It's GSLB. Yes. Okay, and are you running that uh, like off of a service, like an S1 or? F5. It's F5 GTM? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we're, DNS, we're, my bad. <laughs> Yeah, we're using F5 GTM and we're using F5 LTMs as IP concentrators. Okay, cool. Thanks. 
Other questions? Okay, I'm either that, either I'm that good or you're that bored. talked a little bit about some of the metrics that you were looking at from starting to your, your end product. Um, what are some of the typical metrics round trip time? Um, you know, were there certain things that you were looking at trying to figure out how you could reduce those times between the different data centers? Yeah, so one of the problems we had going into this was um, uh, we've got divisions all over continental US. And one of the complaints we've gotten was from one of the divisions, I'm not naming names, but um, they had severe latency. Um, and it was pretty bad. Um, they saw, I can't give you like hard numbers on milliseconds, but I, I can tell you according to synthetics, they saw a 20% improvement moving to this because previously you were locked to a data center. So, if everything processing this data center, if I didn't have a local dependency, I'm shipping you across the country for every one of those calls. Now with service agility, I'm cutting you across the country to the most performance site. So that's getting you a performance boost because you're cutting across on the, you're cutting across this way. I don't have to cut you down, go through another tier, and then cut you over sideways. You're going directly to wherever's fastest. And then that caching, also allowed for all that, that non-data content to be that much closer to them. So now they're pulling more of those images, more of that CSS, more of those flat files, that much closer. Do you manage some kind of uh, system, uh, user persistency between data centers, or is it something that your, your application doesn't? So we're actually handing it on the back end with the microservice. Yeah. Um, we used to try and do server or use user affinities. The problem is um, that our, basically our footprint's so wide that we couldn't be assured that people get the same uh, BGP path each time, so they might hit a different DNS server, which got them to a different data center. So we're actually handling it the microservice layer. So all the microservice tiers themselves, um, they all maintain their own local cache, and that cache is oh, automatically okay. replicated. Okay. Yeah, when we, when we built our microservice tiers, regardless of what the OS is, we built them as basically freestanding instances. So they've got a data tier, they've got a logging tier, um, they've got a configuration cached here. They've got everything they need to survive on their own so that I'm not wait so I'm not dependent in one data center on another data center because we've had too many issues about that. For the uh, configurations for the Nginx piece, are you guys modifying those or updating them dynamically or? So we, we did. Um, unfortunately, the security scanning, uh, one of the junk parameters they sent would always wig it out, so we had to disable it. Right now, what we're doing is we built a Ansible script, because um, we're hosting multiple applications on every one of these, so we actually have an Ansible script that uh, goes through, pulls a series of configs from GitHub, and then pushes them down to the individual servers, so our Nginx config is just basically our upstreams and a bunch of includes. Okay, thanks. All right, that's it. Thank you for your time.